Hi everyone, welcome to this week's episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, where we were joined at the Soho Theatre by Ella Al Shamahi. Uh, yes, it is Ella, our explorer friend. She's a paleoanthropologist, she's an evolutionary biologist, a TV presenter. She is absolutely badass, and she came to join us on stage for a really, really fun show. Absolutely certain you're going to really love this one. I just messaged Ella, she's off somewhere around the world. Um, and asked her if she wanted me to plug anything. She said not, but um, I really think I should probably mention that she does have a book. It's called The Handshake, A Gripping History. Uh, That's available wherever you get your books. One last thing while I have a little bit of time is if you go to nosuchthingsafish.com and look for the shop there, I don't think we've mentioned this for a while, we have quite a bit of merch that you can get hold of. There's nerdy t-shirts, there's pin badges, there's all sorts of stuff. There is also the ultimate ultimate guide this was like a program that we made for our live shows it was put together by alex bell it's got interviews it's got photos it's got tons and tons of facts Andy did a whole page on moss basically if you love the show you will definitely definitely love it so yeah go to no such things of fish.com and look for the shop and you'll find the details there but anyway let's just get on with the show live from the soho theater in london with ella al shamahi okay on with the podcast Hello and welcome to another episode of No Such Thing as a Fish, a weekly podcast this week coming to you live from the Soho Theatre. My name is Dan Schreiber. I am sitting here with James Harkin, Andrew Hunter-Murray, and Ella Al-Shamahi. And once again, we have gathered around the microphones with our four favorite facts from the last seven days. And in no particular order, here we go. Starting with fact number one, and that is Ella. Whales don't have tear ducts because there's no point in crying in the ocean. <laughs> Wait, all right. I feel like I must have at some point cried in the ocean and, <laughs> yeah. and felt a bit better for it, you know. There's That's a, true. Yeah. No one can yeah. see you cry in the ocean is the right. point, right? And this was salty can... when I got here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you not see people cry in the ocean? If your head's underwater. <laughs> <laughs> no, hold, do you, oh. no, hold on, seriously. Okay, if you're actually properly bawling, yeah. would, would you be able to tell? You'd certainly be able to tell the facial expression of someone who's crying. For sure. Okay, so that, that I think that's what's really amazing to me about this fact yeah. is that um, I when I think about whales, I think about their their songs, right, and how oh, like yeah. emotive they are, how they move people. Like, there's been congressional hearings in the U.S. where people haven't actually given testimony; they've just played whale song. Wow. And to think that those beautiful creatures who sit there like communicating in this way that's just like moves us can't cry it's really but they cry, they cry vocally don't they yeah that's that we know about what they do that right <laughs> how is your cd selling dan of, uh, dan's song shriver's whale song yeah, you sell it yeah. in shopping centers don't yeah, you you're yeah. dropping to sleep it's very calm <laughs> Um, but they oh. do do that, right? <sighs> yes, so 100% they express emotion, etc., etc. I've got a question. Yeah. Uh-huh. So if, because obviously they live in water, if you cry, there's your water is coming out of your eyes, would yeah. it be a pressure problem? As in, is, oh. would it be harder to push a tear out of your eye? <laughs> Probably not. I don't know. See, For a thing, whale. Apparently be, they just yeah. don't have tear ducts. So they just yeah, don't have right. the duct full stop. They, they can, they've still got the ability to secrete and clean their eyeballs. Yeah, yeah. so they've got like a useful tear, basically. Like a, win, like a windscreen it's water. It's like a windscreen, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Okay, uh, can, I, can I, I just want to test a misconception that I definitely had before researching this, and I wonder yeah, if anyone else in the room had it. Yeah. Right, I have had tear ducts wrong my whole life. I thought that tear ducts take the tears from wherever they're made to your eye. Uh-huh. Right? Right. Does anyone else think that? Yeah. Yeah, some. Okay, some. Not, I mean, not, not as many as... <laughs> not nearly as many as I hoped would ha- have this, made this error. But no, they carry tears away from the eye. Which oh, I like. They're the I drainage... Ba- the tear duct is the, is the gutter for, oh, for tears. Right. They get made kind of in your eyes, lacrimal sac, and then they run into the corner and then that 
that collects and then it drains into your nose, which is yeah. why when you cry, your nose runs. If you look so, into okay. the corner of someone's eye, you'll see a little black dot and that's the tear dot where the tears go into. Right, and it's just the gutter. It's not like a it's sort of, I thought it was a kind of... But so how come our nose doesn't run every single time we cry? It, it, it will does, do. It does, but it does might it, go down different... the back of your nose different as opposed amounts? to... Ah, okay. yeah. Another thing that's um, similar between the nose, the tear ducts and the nose is that in Wales, um, they have this stuff that they put on their eyes, but it's much more viscous than human tears. Yep. And it's full of mucins, uh, which basically means it's the same as snot, pretty much. Not exactly the same, but it's got the same stuff in. And they don't have to do it very often. They only have to do it every couple of hours. They kind of smear their eye with snot, and then they don't have to blink again for hours and hours. <laughs> Is it worth the trade-off? <laughs> Of never mm. having to blink, mm. but you have snotty eyes. That's my I would question. go for that. Would yeah. you? I would go for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because the ocean would wash it off, right? Uh, it does eventually. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty useful. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just thinking. You just save all that time. You know, constantly. Sorry, I'm late. I was blinking. <laughs> yeah. kind of. But you miss like a tenth of whatever's happening in the yeah. world, don't you? Or yeah. maybe oh, a bit less. This is why less. you need more women on this panel. <laughs> what? Uh, <laughs> what? what? Like, oh, should we have snotty eyeballs? <laughs> Well, yeah, such as lads, <laughs> fucking lad chat. <laughs> Come back to mine, guys. Let's talk about fucking eyelids on whales. <laughs> <laughs> Strip clubs, fuck that. We're going to talk about the nose problems. You know I preferred it, Dan, when you were doing whale sound. <laughs> 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 Oh. Shall we do some lads, lads, lads stuff then? <laughs> yeah. Let's, so yeah. what is the one body part of a whale that will be able to tell you what species they are better than any other body part? Ooh. Oh, what like what species of whale? Yeah. Because I know it's a whale already. You'll know it's a whale. Yeah, okay. You're like, oh, is this a pygmy right yeah. whale or is it a oh. whatever whale? Well, the right whale has the biggest testicle in um, in all of the whales uh, species. Whale there we go. There's well, that no, your bit? Of, yeah. all, of all species on Earth, right? It's of the biggest species. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's bigger than an They're elephant. Big. They're I big. Thought, yeah, I would have thought blue whale. Okay, uh, Ella, do you want to have a, have a pitch? No, oh, geez. Uh, the... That's right, the vagina. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Wow, the... <laughs> do you know what? Wow. You, you laugh about this. I was once on camera <laughs> trying to do a whale uh, necropsy, which is like the autopsy you did give an animal, um, walking past this huge say whale, and on camera, we're like talking through all the different bits, and then I'm about to point at something and be like, so what's that? Because <laughs> it was so huge. <laughs> wow, that's It was amazing. quite terrifying. That is right, I've never seen one in real life, but I'm only going off what I've read. Okay. Um, but apparently, um, so there's a woman called Dr. Sarah Mesnick who studies whale vaginas, and she says that basically they're just a series of flaps, folds, blind alleys, funnels. They said that the first time they opened one up, they couldn't work out, like in a maze, they couldn't work out how to get from the opening to where the sperms needed to be. They mm. literally couldn't work out the maze. Wow. Yeah. Like okay. most men. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, and because wow. they're so different in all the different species, they're a really, really good way. If you only have one piece of a whale to look at, yeah. okay. go for the vagina. Can I, can I pick the whale's head to differentiate the species? Is that yeah. allowed? Sure. And you're saying you the vagina's a better steer. Well, they all just look like whales, don't they? Yeah. That's true. Oh, I guess that's so. really not true. But no, they don't. Like, <laughs> like there are some of the whales, like a beluga whale looks really different yes. to, yeah, yeah. to a, um, a sperm whale, for instance. But yeah. a lot of the like, closer species do look quite similar, mm. I would say. Um, do, you want to, do you want a fact about whale eyes? This sure. is a, as we're on tear ducts and whales. Yeah. Lots of whales can't see blue. Oh. <laughs> Oh, that's oh, another sad. really sad it's one. It's really sad. <laughs> yeah. They're monochromatic. They just see shades of grey. Yeah, it's oh, really weird, isn't it? so no. depressing. Yeah, they can't yeah. cry. They can't see colours. I don't know what... I, I just feel really moved by... I, it's not, everyone's moved by whales, right? That's like a thing. Yeah. Yeah, so I think like facts like that just make me a bit sad that they mm. don't... But they can see something very cool. This is great. So um, whales have big, big eyes, right? Um, actually, not that big, com as in compared with the size of the whale. They're obviously way bigger than our eyes, but th uh, they're not huge. Sure. And their pupils are about half as large, again, as human pupils. So again, not a huge discrepancy, but enough that means... I was reading a, an article about astronomy. It was a brilliant article. Even with that smallish difference in pupil size, they would be able to see twice as many stars in the night sky as we can. Wow, oh, that's cool. Oh. But they live underwater. 
but they do come up. They do come they up. Do they come do come up. Yeah. Although they have to remember to breathe, which I think is quite amusing. They must having to remember to breathe. Yeah, yeah, it's not automatic. That's incredible. Oh, because yeah. they can commit suicide, can't they? By... <laughs> it's really dark. Yeah, it's really dark. Yeah, Join yeah. us next week on Sad Facts About Whales. <laughs> <laughs> no, they can't. Those are the interstitials there's... between my whale cries so on my CD. A... <laughs> whales commit suicide. There's a... <laughs> anyway, listen, can I steer us away from this incessant lad chat and get us to something different, which is um, in Star Trek, as part of the crew, there are whales and dolphins on the actual Starship Enterprise. Are there? Yeah, what? there's, yeah, there's, a, there's a cetacean navigation lab, which is always alluded to, which consists of 12 <laughs> bottlenose dolphins and a couple of uh, whales that are and on board. And is it because they can see the stars better? It's, <laughs> echo <lo> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it's with the it's their echolocation and it's the navigation system. What, so like space echolocation. Yeah, so they're That's navigating cool. for Captain Picard. They're like, where should we go? Ask the dolphins and whales. <laughs> Isn't that cool? It's utterly bizarre. Yeah. Cool. Surely their echolocation wouldn't work in space. They're probably uh, space whales. As in, they're probably... Oh, right. I, oh, I assume they're space whales, as in... I think it's the future Star Trek, right? So they must have evolved to... Oh, Has the of... universe evolved to have molecules in between the stars as well? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to move on in a sec. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, Wait, oh, what about oh, oh. crying? So many. Yep. Doves don't cry. Oh. Doves, don't. Oh. doves don't cry. I think most animals don't cry, really. That's do true. They? But there's only one song about doves that do cry. <laughs> it's like Princeton really saw called When Worms Cry. <laughs> um, no, they, they do have tear ducts, uh, gutters, uh, and can keep their eyes moist, but they don't, uh, they don't do emotional crying. Talking okay. of birds, you know how we always think like the bird song. <laughs> Talking should, of birds, who's the real... lad now, hey? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know how we think bird song is all about communication? Yeah. yeah. Um, they've discovered that actually, no, sometimes birds are just muttering to themselves. <laughs> <laughs> no. It's just so cute. Apparently, yeah, the, apparently sometimes they're just like, mm. it's just really not going well so today. So I, I read that whales, if there's like predators around and they have their baby whales near them, they'll whisper like, guys, we've got to be careful. Like, whales whisper. Cool. Hello. That's pretty yeah. fascinating that they know to lower their tone. So my, my second crazy whale fact, if I can get it in, is that since the late 1960s, blue whales have lowered their, um, their sound, so like they've got more baritone, shifting the equivalent of three white keys on a piano, which ironically used to once be made of whalebone. Um, mm. And it's, like, it's really mad how they've completely changed, um, as well, the distance that they can communicate in. And, and part of that might be a good reason. So it might be that they have gone lower in sound because there's more of them since the 1960s because the whaling conventions and oh. anti-whaling and blah, 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 and all, it's actually worked. Um, but the bad uh, explanation is that the ocean's more acidic and therefore sound travels quicker anyway. So, uh, so it's like you can pick your explanation. Yeah, yeah. Be happy or depressed, wow. basically. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Bad place to end, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me quickly tell you about um, some, some new science that's been done. So there were some people who were swimming next to a whale. Uh, and before they knew it, um, this guy who was writing about it said, the water was like chocolate milk. I couldn't see my hand when I held it in front of my face. I had poo in my eyes, mouth, wetsuit, <laughs> everywhere, and I was soaked in it from head to toe. Oh, no. Okay, but the interesting thing is they reckon this is evidence that perhaps whales will expel feces <laughs> when they're scared as a defense technique to try and stop people from attacking them. <laughs> so that's maybe. Pretty, maybe. I exactly. have a mate who collects whale poo. She's yeah. like Asha DeVos. Yeah, she's really into like Sri Lankan whale poo. Has she ever been covered in it like this person? I think there's a bit, but not quite to that extent, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I read this article in Vice, and they said if this poo nado was newly observed defense mechanism, then the divers have made a great discovery. If not, they just got covered in <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> Stop the podcast! Stop the podcast! Hi, everybody. Just to let you know, we're not sponsored this week. Hmm? We're not sponsored this week. Okay. But on with the podcast! Hold your horses, Dan. We're not sponsored by someone in particular. This week, we are not sponsored by Make My Money Matter. Yeah, Make My Money Matter is raising awareness about something that I think most of us have no idea about. For example, did you know that there are three trillion pounds invested in UK pensions? And without you knowing it, it is being invested into places that are actively harming our planet. 
That's right, your pension could have thousands of pounds invested in things like fossil fuels and deforestation. That's the bad news. The good news is that it does not have to be this way. That's right. If you head over to makemymoneymatter.co.uk, they are going to show you where you can reinvest your pension money, which is so simple to do. Andy's already done it, haven't you, Andy? I did. It took Genuinely, it took me about 10 minutes, and that was because I couldn't find my password for a little while. <laughs> Switching from a standard fund to a sustainable fund, it is so easy, and it is such a massive lever that you can pull. Make My Money Matter have done some research. They have found that making your pension green could cut your carbon footprint 21 times as much as giving up flying, giving up meat, and switching your energy provider combined. And if you want to find out more, all you have to do is go to makemymoneymatter.co.uk. That's right. So head to makemymoneymatter.co.uk and find out from pensions to savings, investments to bank accounts, and all the other choices out there of how money should be really invested in the right ways. They will tell you they are the place to go. And thank you, Make My Money Matter, for not sponsoring us today. That's right. Now get out there and spend your trillions of pounds. <laughs> okay, on with the show. On with the podcast. It is time for fact number two, and that is James. Okay, my fact this week is that in the 1950s, Campbell's tried to persuade people to start drinking cocktails made out of beef soup. <laughs> No? <laughs> it sounds amazing. It does sound amazing. Do you not fancy that? It was over ice, maybe okay. with a bit of alcohol. <laughs> Lovely. No? Perfect temperature for beef soup. <laughs> I see. So, it was, what, what was the beef soup made of? Like Beef. beef. <laughs> like beef What's broth it? or like... Beef bouillon. Bouillon, bouillon. What does that mean? Bouillon. Uh, no it was just one like knows. beef soup, basically. Yeah. It, was, it was like... Uh, <laughs> soup. I don't know what to soup say. Like, yeah. It's like Campbell's, so they're like tins of tins. Yeah, soup, Campbell's. Basically. Yeah, I know, but like for any bougie women in the room, you know that there's this movement right now with like beef broth and bone marrow. Is it? No, so like, what's that? It's bone marrow is like supposed to be really good for your gut health. Right. Where were oh. IBS ladies in the room? <laughs> Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. Sorry, this is a bit of a laddie podcast. So we don't really, <laughs> don't really do that stuff. Um, this is in 1955. And the idea was Campbell's, they decided that this was going to be their new marketing campaign. They sent a load of what could just be described as cans of soup <laughs> and ice buckets and recipe cards to a load of magazine editors and influencers, what we would call influencers today. <laughs> uh, and they just said, this is the new thing. This is what you have to do. They did adverts in magazines. These soup cocktails actually appeared on menus in Los Angeles and New York. Ugh. And it was all the way up until the 1970s, they were saying that this is something you could do. You could even add bitters, you could add vodka, you could add lemon, but the main bit of it was soup over ice. Yeah, it's and it's so disgusting. Did they have a massive surplus or something whether they were trying to shift or was it no, no it, it was that. just it was just a well, how do we find a new market and yeah, yeah. they as james says it was sent to like the the dodgers the baseball team they all received it it was the marketing these are the this is the wording that they were sending some of the stuff out with and in the adverts for a summertime drink it is low in calories less than 30 calories per generous serving <laughs> it is inexpensive it is especially valuable to athletes and golfers in replacing salt loss through exercise Best of all, it's downright delicious. <laughs> and and they would put they would put the recipes on the side of cans, and there was a moment where they almost made it a thing. Yeah, there was a guy called Lester Lannan who was an orchestral leader, and he introduced a new dance called the soup, um, which you would dance after you've had a few soup cocktails. Oh, it's so I, I, it's a lack of foresight, really, that you didn't think to buy some Campbell's. We should have done. Yeah. yeah, added some vodka, added some. Because the amazing thing is, last year Campbell's did it again. Like no. this disappeared in the 70s, and then last year, the Campbell's website had a page where it could tell you how to make a mushroom truffle daiquiri, a faux mango bourbon sour, a Thai chicken Negroni, no. and a pork ramen margarita. <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, some room temperature water, please. It's so, fat. it's so grubby. Who would try it? Oh, definitely. I, I'd try it. Who yeah, would yeah, try yeah. it? Yeah. Oh, do you lot? Oh, you're really safe, aren't yeah. you? <laughs> it, was, it was a massive thing. And one of the other things which I had never read about before, but this is a thing, like James has said, kind of just keeps coming back. And this is largely down to people on TikTok sort of reintroducing this as a thing. But there's also tomato soup cake, oh, which yeah. is a big thing. And people were genuinely doing Was that, was that doing 50s this. as well? Yeah, it was in the 50s, yeah. It does feel like people thought, well, it's the nuclear age now. Fuck it. 
Yeah. That's just nothing matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now it's 2022 and they're doing the same thing. It's a bad sign. Yeah. I've got a lot of cans of soup left over from COVID. Right, yeah, yeah. Gotta do something with it. Well, enjoy your Thai chicken Negroni. Lovely. <laughs> um, can I tell you a hero of soup? Oh, yeah. One of the heroes oh, yeah. of the soup world. Um, this guy called John Dorrance. Oh, Dorrance. And John Dorrance yeah. became the head of the Campbell Soup Company through his genius. He realized at one point, you know, because I think he was working for Campbell's, and he realized, my God, we're just transporting water. You know, because that's a huge part of the cost of soup is moving it all around. It's just, and yeah, he invented yeah. condensed soup. He created the magic formula. And as a result, his family are all billionaires now. Yeah. Because really? he just thought, let's just take the water out. That's clever. clever. Well, I saw, so the Dorrance family, there was a list of the richest people in the world, the richest families in the world. So we're not talking individual billionaires. In 2023, they are listed as the 19th richest family in the world, according to this list. And above them is basically just a bunch of cocks. It's, um, <laughs> you've got in at number eight, the Cox family, um, <laughs> who they are the ones uh, that have done cable and broadband, Cox Communications. Who else have we got? I'm, we've got. I'm, legally, I'm feeling quite nervous. I oh, know. Uh, have you got more cocks? Well, no, it's interesting. There's two coxes. There's one that's spelt differently. There's the Butts, the Butt family, and there's a Bush. So within the top 20, Four of the richest families are two cocks, one butt, and a bush. What more do you need? Well, there's a hunt, but it was close. <laughs> um, oh. How much money was put into this marketing campaign? Um, well, they were just sending stuff out to people. They did do a full-page advert on Life magazine, so that would have cost a bit. But yep. mostly it was just sending out recipe cards and stuff, so not too much. I just find these food trends to be completely bizarre. Like, remember that paleo trend that was going on? Yes. Oh, the diet, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was that? Uh, you eat like a caveman, so, so you eat yeah. raw meat and dinosaurs? Well, you eat like... <laughs> no! But... <laughs> Yeah. Oh, God, somebody teach him geology. <laughs> okay, so the dinosaurs came, but no. Um, but, um, yeah, no, that's just when, you know, you just eat beef and you eat, like, a lot of meat and grain and stuff. But it was really awkward for those of us that actually studied human evolution because they kept asking us about it. And we were like, yeah, I mean, two things. One is they were eating all aspects of the animal. So unless you're going to start eating the intestines of an animal and the inside of the intestines of the animal, like squeeze out the inside of the intestines of the animal and eat the <laughs> eyes of the animal and the tear ducts, and then it's not really the paleo diet because that's what our ancestors were doing. They were like being quite, you know... Nose eating. to tail. Yeah, th like everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then the other side of it is like, I love this whole like, oh, the original thing was the best thing. Because I'm like, they were all dead by our age. So... Mm. Oh, yeah. Do you know what they I mean? They were all killed by dinosaurs, That's though. the sure. thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were actually... <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Oh, God. We never talked about Bovril properly. We've talked, mentioned oh. it once or twice. All right. Like, what is that? Like, exactly. Bovril God, is... reminds me of your stag do, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh... <laughs> Bovril is, is, it was originally called, it's uh, Johnston's Fluid Beef. And it's just, it's ultra, that's nice. It's ultra condensed, <laughs> very condensed paste, which is very beefy. And it's a bit, uh, can we say it's a bit marmite -y? It's kind of, Ooh, like oh, you make oh, a drink oh, out of it. It's like, a, really. it's like a very thick substance. You, make, you turn it into a drink. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know? It's so, like very weak beef soup, but you drink it like tea. Meat tea. You drink it? Yeah. Meat, meat yeah, yeah. tea, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a drink. Is this an English thing? Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is... But no. Bovril used to, it used to be absolutely huge. It, used to, it was yeah. invented in about the 1870s, and it was, again, like, condensing all the good stuff and the invention of stock and things like that. Um, but, uh, in fact, the Pope appeared in a Bovril advert at the <laughs> time. He? Yeah, Pope well, Leo... Like a the, TV ad. No, is that uh, not unethical for him? A TV ad in 1870. No, it was, no. it was, sorry, I missed the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, it, was, yeah. it was only in 1900, but it was, an, it was a magazine ad. Yeah, and yeah. I don't think it had full papal clearance because <laughs> it showed him drinking Bovril on his papal throne, and the slogan was, the two infallible powers, the Pope and Bovril. Um, <laughs> so it was, not, it was not strictly on brand, I think, for him. Um, but have you heard of Chevril? Chevril? No. Yeah. no. Can um, you have a guess? Is it Chicken Bovril? Is it's it a different country? Not, it's Chev... Is it Chev Chervil? Uh, it's not Chervil. Oh. Cheval. Horse. Oh, it's horse. Oh. And this was not an official drink. It was a siege drink during the Boer War. The Boer War? <laughs> the Boer... Boer... Burr? Is that the one that keeps appearing on my iPhone that tells me to celebrate the day? No, that's the Battle of the Boyne. Ah, the Boyne! <laughs> um, sorry, the Boer War. Boer War, yeah. That was... <laughs> How are we saying... The, say, the sorry, way so you, you say sound it. it, it's like a butter war in France. Boer. Boer. B-O-E-R. Yeah. Oh, we all know... Wait, say it again. Boer. 
Burr. 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 Anyway, during that conflict, uh, <laughs> it was the second of those two wars, by the way. Uh, there was a siege. There was a place called Ladysmith that was under siege oh, yeah. as, yeah, part of, yeah. as part of the... Oh, it might have been the first one. And the garrison, they were so desperate that they made themselves horse bovril because by the end of the siege, they were so reduced to eating. You know, you'd eaten all the food. They'd eaten all the stuff that looked a bit like food, and then they had to eat the horses. But they had a bit of fun with it because they got to, you know, boil down the horses and make chevril. Mm. So that just shows the cultural power of bovril. It seems... <laughs> It might seem like I said that quite long thing for no good reason, but that's not the case. <laughs> just, okay, just, so do people still eat, drink bovril? Yeah, yes. it's very big yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very big It's here. massive. Really? You would yeah, get yeah. it if you go to a, to a football match, you would see it. Yes. Do you? Oh, yeah, you've mm. been to a pub at Last Orders. Yeah. Yeah, everyone, have you noticed? Everyone around you gets a steaming hot mug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the final, yeah. 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 It keeps you warm on the walk home. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Bovril for your walk, sir. Yeah. You must have... You, yeah. Okay, I know that's untrue, that. obviously. They ring the Bovril bell, don't they? The bell. This is a podcast about facts, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, okay, so you guys have all had Bovril. Yeah. If, well, no. Yeah. no. You've had Bovril. Ella, it's like... Everyone, <laughs> it's very uh, like, and I'm not British, but I've yeah. Well, yeah. after this, if anyone wants Bovril, we'll all go together. Well, we gotta wait for last orders. And you can have, <laughs> we got no choice. Well, why don't we all go and have the most expensive soup in the world? Do you fancy some of that? Sure. It's called cordyceps soup. Would you like some cordyceps soup? Sounds like a mushroomy uh, thing. Yeah, mushroom, mushroom. mushroom. You like it? It's uh, got chicken, so obviously oh, okay. it's veggies. Yeah, so we'll yeah, have sorry. It, but right. we could have it without the chicken. Red dates, Logan berries, and cordyceps, which is a mushroom. Yeah. It's that mushroom which goes inside caterpillars and sort of <laughs> makes them climb up to the top of a plant and then grows out of their brains and then makes birds eat them. You know that mushroom? Yeah, I do, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Lovely parasitic mushroom. Yeah. Sure. yeah. It goes out of the brains and then they explode and all the spores go everywhere. Yeah. Again, I think the room temperature water just feels <laughs> hungry. Well, oh, wow, is that... This is the world's most expensive soup. Uh, one bowl is $688, last right. time I checked. And it's made with this stuff. And these, um, these cordyceps fungi, which grow in the insects and caterpillars, especially in China, in the Tibet area, they get it, and it's supposed to be, you know, very good for you. Right. Is it, that's, that's the same mechanism as in the TV show and the computer game, The Last of Us. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. It's it's based, that's, that's what it's based on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 If the, and like, if the zombie apocalypse happens because some people wanted expensive soup, that's going to be <laughs> so... <laughs> Can you time it, it as well? Yeah. You know when we go see flowers that we know are going to bloom once every hundred years and they open? Can your, can your meal arrive as just an intact bird and then suddenly it just <laughs> explodes yeah. out? That would be great in the mouth. Yeah. But also you're saying people in the Himalayas are spending $600. Pounds. Uh, no, so they take them and then they take them to rich Chinese yeah. cities. Oh, those uh, Sherpas, they own so much, don't they? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Honestly, those guys. But um, the, there was the Chinese National Games in Beijing a few years ago, and there was two athletes, Wang Zhengxia and um, Chu Yongxia, and they beat the world records in the 10,000 metres, the 3,000 metres, and the 1,500 metres. And the newspapers all said it was down to this stuff, this cordyceps soup that they right. were drinking. Were they getting close to the finish line and then something just erupted <laughs> out of their head and pushed them over? It seems, looking back, that it might have been due to state-sanctioned doping, but... <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Who Probably just know? that delicious mushroom soup. <laughs> Do you know um, Webster in America? Dictionary. Yeah. 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 Um, so when he was putting the dictionary together, he kind of just changed certain words to what he thought was the better pronunciation, the better, yeah. the better wording, rather, the better letters to be used in the word. So Spelling. Word, yeah, so like the reason... Um, <laughs> um, sorry, I just... I don't have his book on me to have looked that up. Um, <laughs> But so the word center, he changed to ER. Okay. That's why yeah, Americans yeah, yeah. do it He's ER. Responsible. He's responsible. Color, there's no U in color in America because of him. But there were words that he tried to use but were kind of rejected by others. Did he do soup? And soup was one. So soup was meant to be spelled S O O P, according mm. to Webster. Mm. Ah. So the Americans might have had soup. Yeah. Gosh, imagine having that kind of power that you can just. Literally yeah. change words. Exactly. An island he tried to change as well. So island, he was going to get rid of the S. So it was I-L-A-N-T. Oh, so island. And is, he was going to get rid of the S <laughs> and put it as is. Oh, was like, it, and that is F. Oh, yeah, sorry. Otherwise, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's just I. Yeah, yeah. Um, I need to move us on to our oh. next fact. So, um, okay. Are you upset? <laughs> Do you want to gonna, cry? Well, there was a... <laughs> I am crying. You can't tell because I'm crying into the ducts. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, I was going to ask if you wanted to talk about portable soup, pocket soup. No. Okay. So, <laughs> it is time for fact number three. <laughs> Oh, give us portable soup. Give us portable well, soup. Well, it's also known as veal glue. I mean, there are a few different names, but it's basically oh, yeah. it's basically just um, solid soup. And again, it was it was invented in the 17th century. It's something to carry around, something to take away to sea with you, like a proto bovril. Really, it's just yeah. condensing. You boil it down. You boil it down. You boil it down until eventually you have this gelatinous chunk of soup, and then you just rehydrate it. And so uh, Lewis and Clark, when they did their expedition, th they took 193 pounds of solid soup. Mm. So that would have made that would have fed them for ages, but yeah. they only ate it when food when things were really desperate. I think that's because it was disgusting. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. We had a fact also from a listener about Lewis and Clark, which is part of the reason I mentioned this, oh, which yeah. is that when they went on their amazing trans-American voyage, they took 150 pounds of semen with them, which was their dog. He was called Seaman. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm out. <laughs> okay, it is time for fact number three, and that is my fact. My fact this week is that in 2003, there were 4,096 fraudulent votes in the Belgian election. The culprit, it was later discovered, was the universe. So what happened is <laughs> the universe... It's always panto season at the Soho Theatre. <laughs> <laughs> the, the universe accidentally voted in the Belgian election um, and it was down to cosmic rays. So mm. basically, this, 2003, there was a lady who was uh, running for a unionist party and she was called Maria Vindvogel. Apologies for the pronunciation. And um, it was National Election Day and there was a precinct where they were having the votes counted and as they were counting it, it sort of registered 4,096, which seemed impossible because that was more than there was possible to have in that area. So they thought something dodgy is going on. They had every single person in computers in the area look at the machine, try to work it out. <laughs> what the hell's going on? Nothing. Why are you guys laughing? Have you is tried that... turning that off and on again? They yeah, tried yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> It's just, sorry. So, so computer sorry. people came. Yeah, they studied, and yeah, they, yeah, 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 yeah. Ew, you're in computers. <laughs> so they looked so at it. Yeah. They looked at it. And, and they looked at it and they saw that 4,096 was a very computery number. Yes. Isn't it? Is it genuinely? It is genuinely. It is, yeah. Some people here will have worked it out. Two to the 12. Two to the 12. Oh, two, two to the 12. Oh, okay, okay. Bovril, later, two you lot. The, <laughs> <laughs> it's two to the 12. So in binary, it's one zero 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 twelve 12 times. And so one of the zeros must have turned into a one. Yeah. So that's... Oh, okay. Exactly. Okay. I didn't okay. get just that, but sort of sure, yeah. <laughs> like a, like a, a mad, tiny glitch. A mad, tiny by, glitch, yeah, yeah. suddenly, and they couldn't work out what it was. And then a while later, there was a conference of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. This was happening in Boston. And it was during a talk called Cloudy with a Chance of Solar Flares that it was revealed <laughs> that they believed that it was the cosmic rays of the universe that had hit it at this precise moment, yeah. which happens a lot on our planet. Um, I think somebody should call Trump up or his lawyers and be like, yo, we've got you a better excuse for that whole election debacle. <laughs> this man is just sitting here ruining democracy yeah. by like telling everybody, well, here's another excuse we can use in court. Yeah. Uh, it's it's actually solar flares. And that one over there is giving you mathematical formulas. Yeah. And I'm like, no part in any of this, but carry on. No. <laughs> I like the way that it was solar flares that changed this election. So that old newspaper headline, which was the sun what won it, Literally, Superb. was true. Super. Ah. That's very good. Yes. Yeah. Um, we, should we say what a cosmic ray is? Yeah. Sure. So it's. It sounds like a ray, but actually, it's not. It's a, they're particles. They're pieces of atoms. They're obviously incredibly tiny, and they are passing through all of us right now. Even in this basement, we're not safe. Um, <laughs> They're not harmful, that's the good news. Um, but every, at sea level, roughly where we are, every square centimetre of the planet gets hit by one uh, muon every minute. And they're going at 90... That again? Muon. It's what you make bovril from. <laughs> <laughs> it was discovered during... What was that war again? The boor. <laughs> <laughs> A muon. A muon. Muon. Yeah. All right. And, uh, um, but all of us now, all of us are being, like, just 
bang, 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 muons passing right through us. Right. All of us now are being, is no one concerned even slightly? <laughs> I'm but, concerned. But you said it doesn't harm us. It doesn't harm us at all. Not <laughs> it's, I'm not concerned. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what the muon lobby would say. Yeah, yeah. Here's the thing, we say it doesn't harm us, it absolutely does harm us because it harms the things that we use. It harms communications, it harms, if you're, there's, there's examples of airplanes literally dropping hundreds of feet yeah. because they've been hit by a cosmic ray and the system has rebooted and freaked out. And those- It's rare, it's really rare. It's really, it's really, rare. really, really rare. It's really, really rare. So the problem, one of the problems that there is going forward is that these particles have energy and they can change, they can flip transistors basically. A transistor is a little switch in an electrical thing. Now, the smaller a transistor is, the less energy you need to flip it. And the more you have, right. the more susceptible you are. And as time goes on, we have way more transistors in everything and they're way, way smaller. So in theory, it could be worse as time goes on. Mm -hmm. It's bad. Yeah. It is yeah. bad. Yeah. So yeah. You said it didn't harm us. You know when no, this I'm happened? Wrong. I'm wrong. Yeah. Do we know if people were scared, were suspicious, thought there was some kind of fraud going on. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, fortunately, because it was so obviously fraudulent that yeah. it was called immediately even by the party that yeah. they just yeah. knew. They were just, a small party, right? So it wasn't... Yeah. And they know because in the Belgium elections, these machines, they do multiple different counts in different ways. And if any of the counts are different, they know there's something off. That's clever. Basically. Did she end up winning, by the way? I don't no, think so. No, 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 she didn't, no. Oh, that's sad. Yeah, she never was going to, which hence why it was sort of, she saw the numbers and she was like, my God, the revolution is here. <laughs> and, uh, this is yeah. the way that they do the, um, the elections in this part of Belgium. So the voters are given a magnetic card with a magnetic strip on it. They feed that into a computer. Then they use a light pen to point at a television screen, uh, and that what? information then goes back onto the card. They take the card out, they put it into an urn. People go into the urn, they pick the cards out, they put it into another computer. That information is sent on the internet to another computer, which is in the polling station. That information is then put on a 3.5 inch floppy disk. <laughs> this was no. in 2003, this no. was happening. Right. Uh, and then it was sent to the head office in the area where they would then put it into another computer which added up all the numbers. Wow. I think there's a lot more than soda flares going on. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. You'd think after yeah. that, I mean, I just imagine the mo if it had been a serious election, the mm. mood would have been, like democracy would have been at stake. People I'm would sure really the people had... of Belgium thought it was a serious election. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Belgium's quite chaotic. Like, they quite did. They had no. Um, they had, had no government, government for, for about five years, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. and yeah. it was fine. Yeah, <laughs> we could just get by. <laughs> so yeah, because cool. have you seen how long it takes to vote? I think yeah. it's just like it's fine. You'll do. You just stay where you are. Yeah. We need to be more like Makassar, Indonesia, which in 2018 um, there was one guy running completely unopposed for mayor and he still lost the election <laughs> to none of the above. <laughs> Do you say Indonesia? Uh, yeah. They have almost the, I would say, the opposite system to the Belgian 2003 <laughs> oh, yeah. system. What? It's entirely... Dictatorship. It's, no, well, <laughs> cross it off the touring schedule for 2024. <laughs> Looking forward to that. Um, uh, they have nail-based voting. So you, you get uh -huh. a ballot form. Ballot yeah. paper? Ballot sure. sheet? You might just call it a ballot. A ballot. <laughs> you get your ballot, and then you punch a hole next to your chosen candidate with a nail, and then you hold it aloft during the count, and you can see where the light shines through the little hole, ah. and that is it. And the, they introduced pens in 2014, but the authorities said, you must use the pen as a nail. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Just uh, not one other election thing that I read. Do you right. know who won the 2020 uh, Nambian election? It was Namibian. a local election. Namibian. Sorry. Yeah, are, you, sorry. are you using Webster's Dictionary for uh, this? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I was looking for the region and then I got confused as I was saying it. Um, so there's a Namib... <laughs> Boa, Wait, boa, no, if, I, yeah. if I take it slowly and we all concentrate, it'll yeah. be okay. You can do it, you can do it. In 2020... <laughs> A Namibian politician. <laughs> Guys, if I cut out all the other stuff, <laughs> it sounds like you're all massive fans of Namibia. <laughs> hey, they have great landscapes, is all yeah, I'm going to say. Beautiful. No, okay, there's a local politician in Namibia who is a... <laughs> where, where's, I'm sorry, where? <laughs> I'm about weird as well. In the but, but say in Did you say Bibia? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what comes out of my mouth. It's, it's, 
it's, it's, in Namibia, there's a candidate. Yeah. yeah, in 2020, there's a Namibian candidate who won a local election who is... Uh, can you guess his name? Can <laughs> you guess his name? <laughs> yeah, whatever we guess is going to be closer than whatever you read. <laughs> It's a, uh, it's a former politician, so it's a name that we know. So it's kind of like... Like oh, Winston Churchill. Kind of like <gasps> that. Tony Blair. No. Oh. <laughs> Just because lots of children were named Tony Blair oh, yeah. in places like Kosovo. Kosovo. After the... well, no, they, they were called Tony Ton- 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 Blair. Tony Blair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a squashed oh, name. Really? It was one Ton- name. Blur. Yeah, it was a yeah. Christian name. Uh, okay, so like, a famous politician. Mo Mollum. Yeah. No. That's good. Ming Campbell. Think bigger than England. Uh, bigger. Um, Eric Pickles. <laughs> No, you're popular, all close. Popular, oh, what, um, maybe George Washington, really famous politician. Yeah, that's a good one, but no. Right. Um, no. Adolf Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a politician there called Adolf Hitler. So Adolf is actually a common name yeah. over was, there. It was. <laughs> is it still a common name? Well, I guess there's a generation that are, oh. yeah, that are sort of like getting into political power <laughs> age. <laughs> and, um, and, and Adolf Hitler said, and it's, his, it's Adolf Hitler, that's his first and middle name. Um, and he... Oh. Uh, he oh, says, right. okay, my dad okay. absolutely knew who Hitler was. I don't think he knew he was a, like, a bad guy necessarily, you know. I, he, so, he sort of gives his dad a bit of coverage on that. But he says... Was, not, wasn't Namibia a, a German it was, yes, colony it was, or exactly. or something? It was, okay. Exactly, so, yeah. it was. Um, so right. he's, he seems... I mean, I didn't have enough time to go to a deep dive into him, but he seems like quite a cheery, happy guy. Um, <laughs> might be restoring the name, I don't know, but... He, um, he said, they said, are you going to change your name? And he said, ah, oh, this is, this, it's on all the papers already. I think I'll just leave it, actually. It's fine. So he's just kept it. And, he's, and he, he won his Did election? He won yeah, it? yeah, he won it. It's yeah. recognisable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> his Wikipedia says, by the way, it says... <laughs> it says not not it says, to be confused yeah, with. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not to be confused with Adolf Hitler. And then on that sidebar, it has occupation, political activist, known for sharing the name as Adolf Hitler. <laughs> That's got to be the disambiguation on Wikipedia with the biggest like, difference in article length between the one guy and the <laughs> yes. other guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know what he's achieved in Namibia, you know. No, true, very true. That's true. Do you know, in, uh, it was 1964, the general election, at which Harold Wilson was the victor in. Yes, mm. defeated Alec Douglas Hume, go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of hot. <laughs> Oh, Dan, where were you during my university years? <laughs> but, um, yeah, so 1964, he says that one of the big reasons he believes that he won the election is because they managed to swing a bunch of the marginal seats that might not have gone to Labour had the turnout not have been as massive, right? So he needed to get the turnout to be massive. Right. And according to him, he managed to do this by persuading the BBC to delay a repeat of Steptoe and Son, <laughs> the TV series, oh, really? and moving it to another time. And as a result, no one was glued to the TV and they went, all right, let's go out and, and vote instead. And he says that he thinks that that's what helped shift Harold the vote. Harold Wilson said that. Harold Wilson said that, yeah. It's actually a bit more complicated than that. Uh, so <laughs> is it... <laughs> Okay, I need to move us on to our final fact of the show. It's time for our final fact of the show, and that is Andy. My fact is that the man who just broke the world record for living underwater got a visit from his 80-year-old mother halfway through to keep him cheerful. (laughs) Oh, that's nice. Sweet Sweet, sweet story. Yeah. He's a guy called Joe DeTuri, and um, he's, he's a brilliant scientist, and he's been studying how extreme pressure affects the human body over long periods of time, and it might be helpful for space missions if, if humans ever go to Mars. So he moved to the Florida Keys. There's, a, there's an underwater lab, and you go down about 22 feet, and you're living under there. The pressure is much higher than at the surface, obviously. So he's, it's a dry environment. You're, you're in a like a sort of pod capsule thing. And he was doing tests on himself every day. He managed 100 days, which is huge. No one's ever lived that far down for that long before. Unless you're in a submarine. Slightly vexed question, never mind. And uh, his, uh, it's the longest underwater in a fixed structure. Sorry, because otherwise a lot of our listeners are on submarines, nuclear subs, and we'll get, oh, we'll get emails. Um, <laughs> eventually. Uh, um, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, and uh, he just, he's an incredible guy. And he got a visit from his mum, who sounds like an incredible woman. Yeah. She scuba dived down to go up to meet him. It was on his, so he did 100 days, and it was a bit, it was a bit further than the halfway. It was 81 days into it. And she scuba dived yeah. down with his brother. And there's this great photo <laughs> so of them funny. just sitting in this underwater, you know, yeah. house. It is quite cool. Like, it's quite a, you know, Ellie, you're an explorer. And it's good that people go down this and do all this thing. But it mm. is a commercial hotel. That yeah. He stayed in. Yeah. So, like any of us, if we could afford it, could just go and live there ourselves. Yeah. Really? Yeah. The That's problem cool. is, there's so many people doing these, I'm going to stay down here the longest yeah. attempts, that the booking is like, <laughs> have you got anything in August? Nothing? Yeah. September? It's nothing. What, one guy? It's like, <laughs> but they yeah, they're someone, it. They don't have someone coming by and cleaning the room every day, do they? Someone <laughs> they, scuba diving down with a mint that they have to leave. <laughs> <laughs> they, will, they will send you down pizza, though. So, it's $800 a night for two people and there's Is that a, it? well you know so no, no, come on 800 that's like for full i would have expected that to be much yeah higher. if you can't scuba dive you also have to pay for a three-hour scuba diving class okay you go. but like some oh. premier inns in the center of town are that at busy <laughs> times that's that's not yeah, bad. I guess so. It includes a pizza dinner, which they send out. <laughs> Apparently, I read the TripAdvisor reviews. Apparently, the pizza is sometimes slightly damp. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. Um, and yeah, and then you can stay, and then you can't fly or dive again for 24 hours afterwards because yeah. of the pressure change that you've had. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you're, pressur you're pressurised, don't you? Yeah, that's the kind of the point of his um, science, isn't it? Yeah. It's like he thinks that the pressure down there is going to help us live for a million years. 110 at least, so he's 55. <laughs> years old and he's saying I believe that if I was living down here that would be I'd be at the halfway mark on my life expectancy so I could make it it's really it's really interesting it is interesting so I, like there's two things that come to mind one is that this um yeah you kind of touched on it which is like this uh, forgive the words I'm about to use, the interface between extreme uh, adventure and science is becoming really weird and actually happened quite recently with Ocean X, right? Um, like, it, it's just this idea that anyone can go on an expedition. Basically, if you, as long as you're willing to pay enough money, like, even even Everest, we're talking about Everest. There's loads of people that now aren't really training for Everest and they've just got these poor Sherpas, basically, like, yeah. literally hiking them up. And there is, I don't know, it's really weird. I don't know how I feel about all of it. This, you yeah. know. Deteri is a legit. Yeah. No, 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 I know. But say, the thing yeah. is, it's like a lot of, um, there's now this really weird move in exploration where a lot of really big research vessels are actually also tourist vessels. Mm. So you can get on these massive vessels that are basically like for people that are spending like £60,000 for their like trip of a lifetime. And there's a bunch of like actual hardcore scientists in the corner doing all this stuff, but also have to give like, a lecture mm, yeah. <laughs> to like all these people and it's just mm, I don't know how I weird. feel about it and they're doing it to help pay for it that's the yeah, thing yeah. it's a funding yeah. issue isn't it ultimately yeah. so it's kind of yeah it's kind of a good way of making sure that your expedition happens at all but I get yeah. what you're saying yeah. it turns it into in, a tourist proposition but, but he's found out a lot of amazing stuff because he was down there he was monitoring every single bit of his body every day so one thing that is going to be probably annoying for the next person in is that the toilet gets a lot of usage when you're down there because your oh. bladder is really squished right so yeah. he said you're constantly just going to the toilet. Um, Increased again. frequency and urgency of urination is yeah. how we put it. And also he says um, that uh, it's interesting that um, the, your, your... I'm so glad you're saying this because yeah, I've I got know, it in was, my notes and you're working out a delicate way to say it. I was trying to look for it. the uh, phrasing. Um, your semen travels at short... Your dog? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> semen travels at shorter distances when you're down there yeah. as well. Okay. Um, and so he... His mother's down there. Maybe that's what stopped it. <laughs> don't come in. Don't, don't skew what I'm down here. I'm doing an experiment. <laughs> You can only enter by rising up through the moon pool in the floor as well. So I'm like, go back down, go back down. <laughs> Is that going to be a problem for people having children? Yes. Like, yeah. he, he, he says that maybe we won't be able to continue the species beneath 22 feet under sea level. Okay. Which is an interesting observation because his point <laughs> is that part of the research, and this was happening a lot in the 60s, oh, yeah, could yeah. we set up underwater bases where people yeah. could live mm. for long periods of time? Uh, Jacques Cousteau did that. Uh, Sylvia Earle went down. She's an amazing, uh, amazing oceanographer. They would go down for 30 days, 40 days, 50 days, and so on, trying to work out, can we live down there? That was the big point. 
push. Let's build these giant underwater right. civilizations, basically. But we won't be able to ejaculate properly. So no, we'll, we will die. You've got to yeah. go up for that, and then you come <laughs> back down. Just a lot of like teenage boys <laughs> just going, I'm just going to go for a quick... Um, <laughs> <laughs> just just want to see the surface quickly. Yeah. Just want to see the stars. Just wanna, yeah. <laughs> There's a whale up there. He can show me some cool new constellations. I was thinking a lot about James Cameron recently. Oh, um, yeah. Because, um, because, again, because of the Ocean Gate thing. Um, when I first heard about what he did in the ocean space, I'll be honest, I didn't really believe it. Okay, he, so he, he went down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench? Yes, he did. The, he's been deeper than any person. Yeah. In the, he's it's been insane deep, that the guy yeah. who directed Avatar 2 has been to the, deeper than yeah. anyone else on the planet. Yeah. yeah, well, he also directed Titanic, so that's closer, right? As a, um, but well, he, Avatar 2, The Way of Water, is a largely aquatic film, so... Yeah, yeah. It's actually, not, it's actually a more relevant thing for me to mention at this point. <laughs> Sure, Andy. Fair yeah. Enough. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Touched a nerve, don't know what that was about, sorry. but anyway. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. I got. Sorry, your CGI sorry. movie <laughs> example, yes. I'm sorry, I got really, really <laughs> cross. Yeah. <laughs> and can I say, that was not hot, okay? Oh, have I undone Anything all my you undid the sexiness of earlier. Of the Alec Douglas Hume moment yeah. earlier, yeah. <laughs> it's so interesting because he gave up his seat in the House of Lords to oh, run God. as the Conservative leader. That's very rare. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? Are you were saying something about... Uh... Cameron also was, went down to see the Titanic. Yes. And so the Marianas Trench, and Sorry, that's yes. his oceanography Sorry. credentials. No, 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 that's not, but that's the thing. That's not just his oceanography credentials. So people think, oh, he... You know, so he's been to, like, the Titanic more than 30-odd times, and you're like, oh, that's... Some... But what's actually amazing is that he is legitimately, in his own right, a deep-sea explorer, not in any way as a tourist, as an engineer. And there are all these crazy stories. So, for example, Bob Ballard, who found the Titanic... I don't know if you guys were following this, but after the whole catastrophe um, with that submersible... Ballard and James Cameron came out publicly and were like, look, there were safety concerns. There were always safety concerns. Um, we've tried to highlight this, they, like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what was really fascinating was watching the interaction between the two of them. Because at one point, Bob bloody Ballard turns around and goes, I mean, yeah, I'll uh, defer to what he said about the mechanics of it. And you're just sitting there going, Bob Ballard is respecting this guy who has won. Like, God knows, you, stay in your lane. Stop making us feel bad about ourselves. The yeah. guy is like this incredible filmmaker and is also this incredible tech guy and the detail he will go into. And then I did some digging and apparently like this has always been the case. Sorry, this is, you've got to understand, it made me feel really bad about myself. So <laughs> apparently at the age of 14, James Cameron turns up to the Royal Ontario Museum where outside they had Canada's first permanent submersible um, and they had it out there and then they were going to put it in the water in Lake Huron for like two years and it's outside the museum and he writes to the museum at the age of 14 asks for a blueprint for the bloody submersible mm. and the guy I think it, uh, his name's Joe McGuinness who's like a really really famous oceanographer he's like okay this is insane sure I'll give you sure. it and he sits there James Cameron 14 and tries to make it based on this blueprint puts a mouse in it well, tries to make his own one yeah yeah right, okay. but a small one puts a mouse in it and puts it in a lake behind the Niagara Falls where he lives and like apparently the, the mouse makes it but it's slightly traumatised <laughs> and then <laughs> And then he's like, oh, I've got a problem with the windows. All again at the age of 14. Writes to this uh, scientist again and goes, can you help me with the window design? And the guy gives him the address to uh, a company that he can write to to get, um, what's it called? The, the perplex glass? What's it called? Perplex? perplex. That, that, we Namibia. Can't, why can't we <laughs> today anyway i think um <laughs> and um and they actually send him a sample and then he attaches it and does it again and like does this whole the age of 14 you're thinking yeah. oh this guy's a genius yeah, that is amazing. Yeah. we're gonna have to move on in a sec because we won't run okay. way over oh. so we, yeah we need to we need to get oh, out no. of here and get our bovrels <laughs> um well i can tell you a few more things yeah. about going underwater so um the word urinator um, originally meant someone who dived. Oh. Okay, that's the first use in English of the word urinator is someone who goes deep sea diving. And then later it became someone who urinates. Must have been a crossover period. <laughs> With hilarious consequences. Um, it's impossible to fart past 20 meters. A challenge. <laughs> A challenge from the people at Guinness. Are you going to cry and fart underwater? Is that what the aim is? <laughs> so Deepest this guy... underwater simultaneous fart cry. One by Andrew Hunter Murray. Wow. <laughs> this guy couldn't have farted in the whole time he was there. He couldn't do. Dr. Deepsea? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Because what happens is, the, the, <laughs> due to Boyle's law, the uh, volume is much, much smaller of your fats, and your body just can't push it through. And so what that means is, as you go up, it expands. No! Oh, what? Wait, that doesn't happen with the other thing, does it? <laughs> <laughs> At the front. You mean the ejaculation I stuff? I do mean the ejaculation <laughs> stuff. <laughs> actually, how you blast your way back yeah. to the surface. <laughs> Lads, 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 lads! <laughs> okay, that's it. That is all of our facts. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to get in contact with any of us about the things that we have said over the course of this podcast, we can be found on our Twitter accounts. I'm on at Schreiberland, James. At James Harkin. Andy. At Andrew Hunter M. And Ella. Ella Ashamahi. Underscore Al Shamahi. Ella underscore Al Shamahi. Uh, or you can go to our group account, which is at No Such Thing, or you can go to our website, No Such Thing as a Fish. Dot com. Uh, all of our previous episodes up there, so do check them out. Uh, Soho Theatre. Guys, thank you so much for being here today. Really appreciate it. Don't tell anyone what happened. Uh, <laughs> but that's it. We'll see you again another time. Thanks so much. Goodbye!